Well, it's my privilege one last time to invite you in this series to open a Bible to the Old Testament book of Psalms. Old Testament book of Psalms, chapter 1. Psalm chapter 1. As you're turning there, maybe a little review. Uh, six weeks ago, we began our exploration of the Hebrew Psalter as a church in a series that we've been calling an anatomy of all parts of the soul, praying the Psalms. Now, our 2025 vision features three clear lead measures that are summarized by the words prayer, care, and share. The mission of Mount Evangelical Free Church is to be and make disciples of Jesus Christ, and therefore our, in our 2025 vision, we believe that God is calling us first to cultivate dependence upon Christ through prayer, to demonstrate the mercy of Christ as we learn to care well for our community, and then to communicate the gospel of Christ as we learn to share the good news with those in our list of five and, and beyond. So prayer, care, share. And if we're going to see growth in each or any of these areas, we want to make sure to spend focused time preaching and teaching on them. So the backstretch of this summer has been our effort to, to consider the first of these lead measures, which is prayer, growing in our dependence upon Christ through prayer. So we turn to Psalms because Psalms is the prayer book of the Bible. It's where we ought to go to begin to learn how to do it. And rather than skirting around the perimeter of this topic, we figured it was probably wise just to give way to the fact that life between Sunday and Sunday can be difficult and painful and thorny as we live our lives east of Eden. And so we've considered what it means not to pray through the best days of our lives, but rather to pray through things like affliction or depression or anxiety or addiction or bitterness. Or last week, we considered what it looks like to turn to the Lord in confession of our sin. What we found week after week is that the resources that are here in God's Word are every bit the match for our complicated lives. We have learned to test the sufficiency of Scripture for the care and the cure of our souls. And this morning, all of that comes together, comes to a crescendo in Psalm 1. And our aim here in Psalm 1 is to consider the link between Scripture and meditation and prayer and how these three contribute to our spiritual health and to our, our Christian maturity. So here's, here's the big idea today. At the end of the day, the Apostle Paul is exactly right. We are transformed by the renewing of our minds. At the end of the day, the Apostle Paul is exactly right. We are transformed by the renewing of our minds. So two points today, we'll, we'll start here. Point number one, Scripture is shameless in pointing us toward an irresistible vision for spiritual maturity. Scripture is shameless in pointing us toward an irresistible vision for spiritual maturity. Now we need to address this word shameless. It is intentional though I realize it may be inviting unintended confusion. Uh, sometimes, because I think that much of the time when we use the word shameless, we use it in a particular way to mean something like corrupt or indecent or improper, and that is most definitely not the way that I'm using it here. When we think of Scripture as, as shameless to point us towards something, what I mean is bold, forward, unblushing, Scripture is brassy and fearless and unafraid to call us to greater and greater heights of spiritual formation and spares no expense in casting a vision for what that preferred future might look like, seeking to draw us out toward it. Scripture is shameless in pointing us toward an irresistible vision for spiritual maturity. And to see how this psalm does that, we're going to begin by considering this preferred future of spiritual maturity as it's laid out in verse 1 and then 3, 4, 5, and 6. 
saving verse 2 for point 2. So let's jump in. Verse 1 reads, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. Psalm 1 begins with an affirmation. Blessed is the man. Just a reminder that when Scripture speaks of uses this word man, it does so routinely to speak of mankind or humanity. That's important in the 21st century for us to remember. We don't speak corporately of human beings this way as man, but Scripture frequently does. First page of the Bible, for example, Genesis 1:27. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Male and female as man. So when we read, blessed is the man, we take this to be referring to men and women, to boys and girls. Blessed is the man. What's fascinating when we press into this word blessed is we see a number of levels on which it's, it's working. For example, the word man is in the singular, but the word blessed is in the plural. It's very strange. What that does is it makes the word blessed blessed jump off of the page of Scripture like an exclamation. It's as if the text is jumping out of its seat to tell us, oh, how blessed, blessed, blessed is the man. That's the idea. And this word blessed or blessed is deceptively simple in the Bible. In one sense, it just means happy, contented, glad, But it's also true that when we see this word blessed, most of the time we're seeing something, we're seeing God make a statement about his prior activity in someone's life. That God is long beforehand with our souls. So when Jesus asked Peter, but who do you say that I am? And Peter says to Jesus, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus shoots right back to him in Matthew 16, 17. Blessed are you. Simon, son of John, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So when Psalm 1, verse 1 says, blessed is the man, all of this is in play. The happiness of the person, not just the happiness, but the extraordinary happiness of the person despite circumstances, and the prior activity of God, the undeserved gift of God's grace. God is present. God is working in the life of this man. It's all packed in here. We notice as well in verse 1 that this person's happiness is inversely proportional to the fact that he walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. Do you see that? His happiness is inversely proportional. That is, as one reality increases, the other reality decreases and vice versa. We we ponder verse 1, it seems clear to me anyway, that there's something curious A sort of gradation, perhaps. You see it in this verse? You feel it in your life? I see it and feel it. The uncanny sense of first you're walking, and before you know it, you're standing. Before long, you're you're sitting. You're sitting in sin. The writer here is saying is that in a minute, in fact, in seconds, one can go from walking with God to then walking among those who don't walk with God in very short order to come to be a mocker of God. This is chilling. There is intentional gradation here, walking, standing, sitting. It takes no time at all, and it can happen to anyone. Remember that no one falls away from the faith. They walk away, one step at a time as easy as walking. It usually begins with an encounter of some sort of suffering or adversity or affliction. And instead of turning to God, we turn to the usual suspects, anxiety, bitterness, depression, addiction. It's like a switch is flipped in our spirit and we shut down toward God. We turn away from Him and we turn toward anxiety, bitterness, depression, addiction, and gossip starts spilling out of our mouths, or maybe it's a hateful word toward our spouse or a parent or a child, 
or a lustful thought begins to lodge itself in your mind and it begins to take over. It's like you're not even in the driver's seat anymore. Is there any preventative for this? What keeps us from the, from the slippery slope into verse 1, the tail end of verse 1 here? Well, the answer is in verse 2, but we're not quite ready to go there. So let's, let's take a little bit more of a peek into this, this irresistible vision before we get to the pathway there. For example, look with me at verse 3. Psalm chapter 1, verse 3, we're presented with the image of godliness all grown up. It's spiritual maturity at full tilt. What does that look like? Verse 3 says, He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season, and its leaf does not wither. And all that he does, he prospers. This blessed person is like a tree. What kind of tree? I'm, I'm no expert in ancient Near Eastern arbor culture, but I suspect if the tree, the name of the tree were important, the psalmist would have told us. I'm not sure that the name of the tree is as important as how it's planted. That's what the psalmist does tell us. It's of striking importance, actually, how it's planted. The text here perhaps could be better rendered, rendered transplanted by streams of water. The NIV says firmly planted by streams of water. That's the idea. The point is that God has planted this tree, and as a result, it's got deep roots. This person, this righteous person is not only blessed, but they're stable. They're unshakable. Many years ago, when I was working my way through seminary, I I worked for a, a tree trimming company in suburban Chicago. And one summer night brought one of the most horrible storms that Northern Illinois had seen in perhaps a generation. And the next day, our crew, and we were out um, surveying the, the wreckage, it was considerable. We, we saw trees down everywhere, across streets and over telephone lines. I remember seeing one tree that had split a person's living room in half on the North Shore of Chicago. It was breathtaking. And I remember at one point riding around with my boss, Gil, in his truck. He happened to be a a fan of the the banjo player, Bela Fleck. I'll never forget it. In his truck, we were wandering around the streets of Deerfield, Illinois, with this eerie space-age banjo music playing. It was like something out of the movie Deliverance. Now, most of the trees that didn't make it were willows and poplars and other shallow-rooted trees but you should have seen the oaks. There was seldom a branch that we needed to clean up to say nothing of an entire tree. The oaks stood mighty after that storm. They seemed to soar into the sky because as Gil described to me, they had a root structure that went down so deep they had become unshakable. They were fastened and tethered to the earth. Okay, that's verse 3. That's this person. It's no wonder that the Lord's vision for his people includes the promise in Isaiah 61, verse 3, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. You say, well, what would that look like? What would that involve uh, to, to be this kind of tree? What would that include? Well, verse 3 goes on to speak of at least three things I see. Nourishment, growth, and what I'll call seasonability. I know seasonability is not a word, but sometimes you've got to make one up. Let's take each one in turn. First, nourishment. Verse 3, he is like a tree planted by streams of water. One commentator I read said that these are irrigation channels fed with a constant supply of water. Doesn't that sound lovely? Wouldn't like you like to be fed with a constant supply of resources? And with that sort of tree that has that sort of water supply, you might expect exemplary growth, and that's precisely what verse 3 says. This tree planted by streams of water is one that yields fruit. Stands to reason. It yields fruit. 
looking at this text over 20 years ago, John Piper had this to say. Oh, for more fruitful people. You know them. The mark of the fruitful person is that when you get around them, you find yourself nourished. They are refreshing and nourishing to be around. You go away from them fed. You go away strengthened. You go away with a taste of spiritual things awakened. Their mouth is like a fountain of life. Their words bring healing and convicting and encouraging and deepening and enlightening. Being around them is like a meal. Yes, it is. Being around some people is like a meal. It's like being fed. You know what he's talking about. So we've got nourishment, growth. We want to be a person like this, don't we? And finally, seasonability. What's that? You know what that is. Verse 3, he's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season. In season. It's not so much that a mature believer bears fruit, but it's how that believer bears the fruit. Perhaps what makes fruit fruit is that fruit is is timely. You don't look for apples on the tree in the spring. You don't look for lilacs to flower in the fall. The idea here is that a person who's growing in godliness has what they need when they need it. The words of a fruitful person are timely and apt. They know when to speak. And they know when to refrain from speaking, even more important. They grow, but they grow at a sane pace. There is a rhythm to their life. There is a balance. They bear fruit in season. There's seasonability, season after season after season. And that brings us, I think, to the rest of verse 3. Its leaf does not wither. Isn't that remarkable? Its leaf does not wither. Were there anything else I think this speaks in, in the godly person's life of endurance. Endurance. The maturing believer displays a kind of patient fortitude that lasts and lasts and lasts. In fact, their lives don't wither. In the summary statement here in verse 3, in all that he does, he prospers. And notice some, I think, English translations get it wrong. It'll say that all that he does prospers. It's not what the text says. That's an, that's an over-promising. Uh, the point is not a kind of naive triumphalism. The Bible doesn't support that. The psalmist isn't saying that spiritually mature people are winners. What he is saying is that all that he does, in all that he does, he prospers. See the difference? A mature believer can and will lose. A mature believer can and will suffer. A mature believer can be manifestly weak and persecuted and die. And yet, through it all, they prosper. They thrive. They advance. They yield fruit. So Jesus says in John chapter 12, verse 24, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. The Christian life is a kind of dying daily. And in that dying, we we live. We live to God. The final color that the psalmist seeks to throw on the canvas here of this vision of spiritual maturity is found if you drop down to verse 6. Verse 6, we read, For the Lord knows the way of the righteous. The Lord knows the way of the righteous. Now, in the Bible... There is knowledge, and there is knowledge. There's knowing, and then there's knowing. When verse 6 says, the Lord knows the way of the righteous, he's not saying that he knows of, or about, or is vaguely familiar with the pathway of the righteous. No, this kind of knowing is an experiential knowing. I remember counseling someone one time, I assigned to them a a booklet for their particular malady because it just seemed like the right word at the right time that they were struggling with. And they're a reader, so they plowed through the booklet fine for me. They came back to the next counseling session completely unfazed. I said, what would you think of the booklet? I said, yeah, all right. (laughs) I said, but this is your issue. What did you think of the booklet? He said, I already know all this. 
I said, evidently you don't, because this is not what I'm talking about here. I'm not talking about knowledge of the verbs and the nouns. I'm talking about experiencing this thing from the inside out. Just because you know something doesn't mean you've incorporated it into your life. So verse 6 tells us that the Lord knows the way of the righteous. Like when we read that Adam knew his wife, Genesis 4.25. Or when the Lord said to Abraham, after he saw that he was willing to offer up Isaac on the mount, now I know that you fear me. The Lord wasn't gathering data. The Lord was experiencing a reality he never had before. Namely, the surrender of Abraham on that mountain, his absolute fidelity. So verse 6 tells us the Lord knows the way of the righteous. Old Testament scholar Willem van Gemeren says, this is not only objective knowledge, but subjective relationship, deep commitment to love for and care for his own. This is what is out in front of you as we consider what it means to grow in Christian maturity. Now, we really don't need to spend an equal amount of time expounding the way of the wicked here, because the bottom line is, once you've seen a vision of righteousness, the way of the wicked does not hold temptation. You're not going to want to settle for whatever's in second place here. So here's what we need to know, verse 4. The wicked are not so. In fact, the literal translation is, not so the wicked. They're not like this tree in verse 4. They're like the chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. The wicked are not like a tree, firmly planted by streams of water, yielding fruit in season. In all that they do, they prosper. It's not like that with the wicked. They are the reverse of that. They are chaff, mere chaff, like when grain is winnowed at harvest time. Chaff is the stuff you throw away. It's weightless and worthless. Wicked people are lightweights, is what this is saying. Lightweights that are completely unprepared for the day of judgment in heaven and unfit for the assembly of God's people on earth. We don't want to be this way. We want to be the first kind of person. So you see, Scripture is shameless in pointing us toward an irresistible vision for spiritual maturity. So the only question remaining is, how do we get there? What does it look like to actually grow and change and become this kind of person? This sort of road to godliness. Well, that brings us to the second and final point today. At the end of the day, the Apostle Paul is exactly right. We are transformed by the renewing of our minds. Therefore, point two, prayer-filled meditation on God's written word is the unmistakable pathway toward spiritual maturity. Prayer-filled meditation on God's written word is the unmistakable pathway toward spiritual maturity. So Psalm 1 verse 2 assures us that at the heart of all true spiritual formation is a romance with the word of God. And in the time that remains, we want to give ourselves to verse 2. Could have spent the whole sermon here, but we had to set it up. So Psalm 1, verse 2. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, on his law, he meditates day and night. If you are drawn to the vision of the ridiculously contented, nourished, growing, seasonable, enduring person who is intimately known by God and enjoys deep, close, personal fellowship with Him, then please pay attention to the pathway that gets you there. It's all packed into verse 2. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and on His law He meditates day and night. Now, the phrase law of the Lord here is just a generic phrase that actually simply points to God's instruction. I don't think it's a technical term referring to the first five books of Moses only. It's broader than that. It means God's instruction, His written revelation. From our vantage point, in order to honor what the psalmist says here, that would be God's gracious self-disclosure in the 66 books of the Old and New Testament, cover to cover, the Bible. 
So while the law of the Lord is inclusive of the law of Moses, it is by no means restrictive to it. The law of the Lord in verse 2 is about the Bible, in other words. And by the way, though, I would say this. It is not, exclu- it is not exclusive of the law of Moses. That is, in your Bible reading plan, don't skip over Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy and look for something good to meditate on. Some of the most beautiful passages to meditate on are tucked into the first five books of the Bible. More on that as we develop this. The psalmist says that his delight is in the Scriptures. He's attracted to the Bible. This person, this godly person is charmed by the Scriptures, cheered by them, enchanted and entertained in Scripture, gratified and gladdened in Scripture, satisfied and sustained with it. Blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord. Which perhaps leaves at least some of us here off balance and in the midst of a catch-22. You see the vision of Christian maturity. You're drawn to it. You begin to walk on the pathway toward it. But if you're honest, you find that you don't really love it. I won't ask for a show of hands, but I suspect that this might well be your experience. You've tried reading the Bible. Maybe even you're committed to reading the Bible. The fact of the matter is you don't really like reading the Bible. You would like to like reading the Bible, but you settle for other things. Things that kind of get you toward the Bible, but not the Bible itself. And you've decided, you've been going at this long enough, that maybe reading the Bible is just for a certain kind of person, like a person who's not you. (laughs) And if this is you, then I want you to listen to the words of a Christian named Jeffrey Thomas. Thomas once wrote a little booklet 40 years ago called Reading the Bible. Here's what Jeffrey Thomas writes, quote, Do not expect to master the Bible in a day or a month or a year. Rather, expect to be puzzled by its contents. It's not all equally clear. Great men of God often feel like absolute novices when they read the Word. The Apostle Peter said that there were some things hard to understand in the epistles of Paul, 2 Peter 3.16. I'm glad he wrote those words because I've felt that often. So do not expect to get an emotional charge or a feeling of quiet peace when you read the Bible. By the grace of God, you may expect that to be a frequent experience, but you will sometimes, often, you will get no emotional response at all. Let the word break over your heart and mind again and again as the years go by. And imperceptibly, there will come great changes in your attitude, your outlook, your conduct. You will probably be the last to recognize these. Often you will feel very, very small because of the increasing greatness of the God of the Bible. So go on reading it until you can read no longer, and then you will no longer re- need to read the Bible anymore because when you close your eyes for the last time in death, never again will you read the Word of God in Scripture because you will open them to the Word of God in the flesh. That same Jesus of the Bible whom you have known for so long standing before you to take you forever to his eternal home, end quote. There's a lot I like about that statement by Jeffrey Thomas. I like the realism, the utter realism of it. I like the hopefulness of it. I love the Christ-centeredness of it, all of which are mission critical if we're going to make progress in coming to know our Bibles better. But maybe what I like most about it is that what he has to say seems to substantiate what the psalmist is saying here. For it's not Bible reading so much that the psalmist is commending or even Bible study, or I would even say Bible memorization for that matter. That's not the verb here in verse 2. In fact, I would argue that while the psalmist is here commending something that might include some or all of those things, the plain truth is is that you can read and study and memorize the Bible and still not do what the psalmist is calling us to do here in verse 2. 
So in the fleeting moments that we have left together, let's ponder what he's actually pointing us toward with these words. Psalm 1, verse 2, blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Oh my, there it is. Blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Now, the, the English word, our word for meditation that we find here in verse 2 is found in the English Standard Version some 17 times. Interestingly, uh, 16 of the 17 are all in the Old Testament, although the reality is, is strewn across both, chapter, both uh, testaments of the Bible. One of the most interesting of the appearances of the word meditation is found in Joshua 1.8. If we want to know what meditation is, we could begin to get an idea from Joshua 1.8, where the Lord instructs Joshua, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you should be careful to do all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. There's a lot there that's fascinating in Joshua 1.8, but I'm really drawn to this idea of the book of the law not departing from Joshua's mouth. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. There was a connection here, a connection between the mouth and meditation that's huge. For example, there's other places in the Bible where the Hebrew word for meditation appears, but it's not translated meditate. And the fact is that when it's not translated meditate, it actually gives us a much clearer vision of what meditation is all about. So I'm really glad it's not translated that way. For example, here's what I mean. The word for meditate shows up in Isaiah 31, 4. In Isaiah 31, 4, we read of a young lion growling over his prey. Can you picture it? Now, it says the young lion growling over his prey. The word growls over in Isaiah 31, 4 is the exact same verb we see here in Psalm 1, verse 2. Meditate. You ever seen a lion on the Discovery Channel with his prey between his paws before he's ready to dive in? What's he doing? You know what he's doing. Right? He's savoring. He's licking his chops. He's taking his time. It's all his. And he's in no rush. Now, in other places in Holy Scripture, the word for meditate is translated with words like moan or mutter. The idea is that meditating on God's Word is less like reading or studying or meditating, though it may include all three, and much more like tasting, chewing, sucking on the contents of Scripture so that you come to swallow them and metabolize them and they become a part of your bloodstream and eventually a part of your body, feeding your growth. I once heard a pastor say, take a lozenge. It was in the middle of February. He took a lozenge out of his pocket. Take a lozenge. Take a word lozenge every day. Put it under the tongue of your soul and let it dissolve. That changed my life when he said that. So the psalmist says, Blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates like that. He meditates. Take a thought, take a word, take a verse with you throughout the day. Mine's right here. It's been here for 20 years. Not this exact note card, but Ezekiel 3, verses 1 to 3. That's been keeping me company. You take a word lozenge, take it with you, let it dissolve in your soul. Now, you meditate on it day and night. Let's dwell on this. Day and night. In context, don't read this as twice daily. Sometimes commentators have thought about that, like have a quiet time in the morning, have devotions in the evening. And while I would certainly support that, I don't think that's what actually the psalmist is is saying here. When the psalmist says, blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night, what he means is all the time from day to night, from morning through the evening. That's the idea. Now link that with what Paul tells us over in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. 
There's something else in our lives that we are to do 24-7. Paul says, pray without ceasing. And if you connect that, Psalm chapter 1, verse 2, with 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, you begin to get a sense of what this can mean. Scripture is God calling out to us. Prayer is us calling out to God. And meditation is what connects the two, running back and forth, informing and fueling our experience of both. Now, the best explanation I ever heard of this, this, this idea how meditation connects between prayer and reading the Word, uh, comes from the pen of the Puritan Thomas Manton. He writes this, Meditation is a middle sort of duty between the Word and prayer. It has respect to both. The Word feedeth on meditation, and meditation feedeth prayer. We must hear that we not be erroneous, and meditate that we not be barren. These duties must always go hand in hand. Meditation must follow hearing and precede prayer. Isn't that good? That's really good. And if you like that, if you like that kind of talk, your community group study guide is filled with it. You've got half a dozen different Puritans all weighing in on the issue of meditation. Nobody in church history was better than the Puritans at unfolding what meditation is. So it's just loaded with juicy quotes from dead guys that I hope you'll enjoy this week. Take a look at that in your family or in your community group. Consider pondering these as you revisit your sermon notes this week. Two more practical thoughts on this, and we'll, we'll finish up for the morning. The first thought is just this idea of time again. And I want to come at it from a, another quote I found help from, a combination of the words of Thomas Kelly and Richard Foster. In Richard Foster's book, The Celebration of Discipline. Some, some of us need to hear that this, this passage I'm going to read to us because sometimes we, we get this idea of meditation in our minds and there is a person or perhaps more than one person here are thinking, okay, like how long is this meditation stuff going to take? Like I have a job. I just can't be meditating all day long, you know. I'm never going to get anything done. That's a fair question. And I love the answer from Thomas Kelly and Richard Foster. Here's what they write. We need not worry that meditation will take up too much of our time, for it takes no time because it occupies all of our time. We proceed, enfold, and follow everything with it. Meditation and action become wedded. There is a way of ordering our mental life on more than one level at once. On one level, we may be meeting all the demands of external affairs, and I would add here changing diapers, driving to work, planning a homeschooling lesson, eating our lunch, paying the bills, meeting all the demands of external affairs. But deep within, behind the scenes, at a profounder level, we may also be in meditation and adoration and song and worship with a gentle receptiveness to divine breathings. Isn't that glorious? That's how you live your life. I remember uh, years ago, I was a brand new Christian, was watching Billy Graham being interviewed by uh, Larry King. And Larry King is leaning forward with those angular shoulders and those long suspenders and on his desk like this looking at Billy. And he says, Billy, you're a praying man. And Billy says, I'm praying right now. <laughs> it was awesome. You knew he was going into that meeting, filled with Scripture, praying, meditation as an as a in-between, between the Word and prayer. We can do this. If Billy can do it on national television, we can do it in our backyard. Now, one more thing, and it's arguably the most important thing as we think about this issue of meditation. What's the goal? What's, where are we heading as we ponder and enjoy and suck all the marrow out of Scripture and apply it to our lives? Jesus says this to the Bible believers of his day, John 5, 39 to 40. If you've heard it once from me, you've heard it a thousand times. You search the scriptures because you suppose that in them you have eternal life and it is they that bear witness to me. Yet you refuse to come to me to have that life. There is a person behind every page of Holy Scripture Old Charles Spurgeon said that from every little town and village and hamlet in England, there is a road that leads to London. So true from every book and chapter and verse of the Bible. 
Every one of them leads in one direction, leads to Jesus Christ. We ought to enjoy gospel-shaped meditation because we are meditating our way through a gospel-shaped book, a gospel-shaped Bible. If you're a Christian, you stand in need of the message of the life and death and resurrection and soon return of Jesus every day of your life. Every day of your life. No days off allowed. And meditating on the Scriptures day and night is the surest road to keep you advancing toward Him, advancing toward Jesus. Well, at the end of the day, the Apostle Paul is exactly right. We are transformed by the renewing of our minds. Scripture is shameless, absolutely shameless in pointing us toward an irresistible vision for spiritual maturity. And prayer-filled meditation on God's written word is the unmistakable pathway toward spiritual maturity. So friends, it's, it's Labor Day weekend. We are right on the cusp of a new season as a church. A new season of life and mission and ministry is just around the corner. So let's make this fall a season of turning to the Word, turning to the Lord through His Word. And wherever you're at or not at in your devotional life, this is a moment for a a mid-course correction. This is an opportunity to hit the reset button. I'll tell you what, I, I do not need a crystal ball because with a national election looming, and the Church of Jesus Christ showing signs of drifting and a culture that is absolutely imploding, we are undoubtedly in for choppy waters over the next season. I have that sense. I think you do too. So for the glory of Christ and the joy of our souls and the ingathering and upbuilding of the Church of Christ, let's dive into the Word of God together. Amen? Next week is kickoff Sunday. You'll be receiving communication from us regarding the 9 a.m. hour. We're still um, working through logistics of what it may look like to meet. And so expect communication from the leadership this week, sooner rather than later, um, about the 9 a.m. hour. We also want to hear from you uh, as far as your presence and investment in that hour as we move toward this fall. But next week is kickoff Sunday. And so we are looking to kick off the Sunday school hour. We'll see if we can put all that together, along with community groups that are going to be set to relaunch, even though they've been more or less meeting throughout the summer. They get uh, kind of a spiritual B12 shot in the fall with an opportunity. It's a great time to, to hop into a group, so please do that next week. And then next week, it's a holiday weekend, so although it was the first Sunday of the month, we didn't take the Lord's Supper this week. We, we usually hold that for the, for the week after. And we're going to observe the Lord's Supper in a real special way uh, next Sunday. It's going to be the centerpiece of our entire gathering. We're going to build everything around it. And one thing we're going to do is that the sermon is going to be drawn from 1 Corinthians 11. And that sermon is going to be titled, When You Come Together, the Lord's Supper and Mound Free Church. A couple of years ago, we had a specific sermon about baptism in Mound Free Church, about what that looks like. We've never done the complimentary sermon to that, which is, how we approach the Lord's Supper. And so I'm looking forward to that. It's going to be a fresh place for us to be in Scripture for a week together. On top of that, in addition to that, we are arranging one week from today for a number of households to be with us who have been worshiping from home. And they're going to join us for the Lord's Supper in in a drive-up kind of fashion. We have the elements uh, in um, sealed Um, uh, containers that are going to be passed out to everyone, and I'm not exactly sure how it's going to work out. It's going to be a little bit awkward, but that's okay. As I read 1 Corinthians 11, that's the way Paul talks about the Lord's Supper, but one of us is going to go out and meet our brothers and sisters in the parking lot. We're going to give the words of institution to them and serve them. Some will hang out and listen to the Wi-Fi on the premises and finish finish the worship gathering with us. Others will go home and finish watching it on uh, on their computer. Um, But we are looking forward to gathering for the bread and the cup together as one body. And I know that our brothers and sisters, some of whom have not taken the Lord's Supper since March, are very much looking forward to being with us in the limited way that they can be. And so by God's grace, it's going to be a great morning together. Let's pray. 
Father in heaven, thank you for this series. Lord, in so many ways, we have simply scratched the surface. The Psalms are so endlessly rich. And I pray that what has been demonstrated at least is that all of our lives are, are here. All of the most difficult issues of our lives are here. Where we need to go when we find ourselves um, uh, it, absolutely reduced to desperation because of our sin, uh, to how to confess our sin is here. And then, Lord, the way out, what it looks like to know and to enjoy and to walk with you, ultimately to find our way to the foot of the cross and the empty tomb every day of our lives as we learn to meditate on Scripture, to find our delight in your word day and night. Oh, God, I pray that you would teach us more about that. This sermon is not the sum total of this conversation this week. It's the rallying cry. It's the kickoff for a whole week of thinking about this. So be with us as we move into group life and study questions and ponder and roll up our sleeves and apply this issue of meditation on Scripture to our lives. May we be a church rich in prayer, informed by the promises of God as we move steadily toward our 2025 vision. We want to cultivate dependence upon you we have a tendency to cultivate dependence in a thousand other places. May it not be so in this church. May we be desperate for you, crying out to you in prayer and finding a satisfying Savior right at the center of the Scriptures for us. Thank you for the gift of the Bible. Thank you for the gospel. Lord Jesus, use this message to build your church, bring glory to yourself, and forward our mission to be and make disciples of Jesus. In your mighty and matchless name I ask it. Amen.